What's up guys, Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Wells Fargo Championship. That's right, we are back at Quail Hollow for the first time since 2019 because this event was not played in 2020. But before we jump into the pricing for this week, I've got some winners for subscriptions to rickrungood.com. It's where all the tools that you see on this channel, it's where they come from. It's my own website. I make them. I enjoy them. I hope you do as well. John Grossman and Petey have won. Uh, I've already reached out to you, John. Petey, I tried to find you on Twitter with the, the handle that you left on an iTunes review. Couldn't find you. Get in touch with me. Prove that you are Petey, and I will get you all set up with a subscription to rickrungood.com. And if you would like an opportunity to win a subscription, there are two ways to do that if you're on YouTube. Make sure that you like this video. Make sure you're subscribed to the Rick Run Good YouTube channel and tell me in the comments who is going to win this week's Wells Fargo Championship. That's one way. The other way, go to the podcast version of this show. It's called 300 Yards to Unknown. Leave a five-star rating and review. Say something nice about the show and leave me your Twitter handle so I can get in touch with you. That's the other way, uh, and it's the easier way to win, quite quite frankly, and I will link uh, the podcast in the description as well. A couple other housekeeping items before we jump in. There is going to be, of course, a betting preview that comes out on Tuesday, a live chat at 3 p.m. Eastern time uh, for all things Wells Fargo Championship, ownership, questions, one and done, whatever you want to talk about, that time is yours. And then Wednesday evening, 8.15 p.m. Eastern time is the Jock Market Power Hour. This is stock market DFS that you can play Wednesday night, Thursday, while the tournament's going on, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's pretty cool. You buy and sell uh, shares or uh, yeah, shares of golfers, which is always a lot of fun. Otherwise, I think that's it. Let's jump into this week's Wells Fargo Championship. All right, what's the course? It's Quail Hollow. This is a staple on the PGA Tour. It dates back to the inception of this event, which was 2003 or 2004. And Quail Hollow has played host every year except for one. That was 2017. That was when Quail Hollow was used for the PGA Championship. And this event was at Eagle Point. So we've really had Quail Hollow on the schedule every single year. Uh, just one year, it was not technically the Wells Fargo Championship. This is... It's a big course. It's it's long. It is a par 71. It can be stretched out to like 7,600 yards. Um, it, it is it is certainly one that you want to be able to take rips at off the tee. There are certainly scoring opportunities out there, uh, but they're not going to come on the last three holes. So 16, 17, 18 names the Green Mile. Uh, remember last week we had the Snake Pit, the the closing stretch at Innisbrook that is very difficult. Well, this is the most difficult three-hole closing stretch on the PGA Tour since this event has been created. So this is tough. It plays about a stroke over par on average, which I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but rest assured it is. When one over par is an average of only three holes, it is a very, very difficult stretch of holes. And of course, I ran the model this week. And if you're new, this is a, a correlation model. It takes um, all of the great data that we have for Quail Hollow, which is pretty complete considering it's been a staple on the schedule. And it looks at the types of players that have success and then what stats those successful players are good at, and we start to build profiles of guys that would fit this course. Now, the last couple of weeks, we haven't had a lot of strong correlations, but we do hear strokes gained off the tee. It's number one. Uh, number one here at Quail Hollow. In fact, there are only four other courses on the PGA Tour where strokes gained off the tee has been more closely correlated to success. So you can be a bomber, you can be accurate, you can be, ideally be some combination of the two. After that, strokes gain T to green pops up. There's only 12 courses in which strokes gain T to green is more important. And then driving distance, um, there's only 13 courses where driving distance is more important. So you're starting to see a trend here. Guys that uh, hit it far, uh, play well off the tee, seem to, or I shouldn't say seem to, if you run the numbers, have had more success than not at these Event. So what types of golfers would that be? Well, it's pretty clear. We can come down here and we can sort by strokes gained off the tee and I can just do, you know, the last 50 rounds. It should be 
absolutely no surprise that Bryson DeChambeau is on the top of that list. He's on the top of the list in driving distance as well. It was a little bit of a surprise to me for the next name, Corey Connors. Now, I'm really interested to see what Corey Connors is is uh, is going to do this week, especially because most people they play a lot of people played him last week, and it was fine. What he finished T21, it's like okay. I was kind of hoping for more, but it's not a terrible finish. He's gaining nearly three quarters of a shot off the tee in his last 50 rounds. 36 of them technically are measured rounds. That's a lot. It's more than John Rahm. It's more than Sung J M. It's more than Rory McIlroy. Connors has been phenomenal off the tee. That was a bit of a surprise for me. Those other names I mentioned right below Connors and then Victor Hovland kind of rounds out some of the top names here as well. And then if you look for uh, driving distance, you're going to see, of course, Bryson DeChambeau at the top. You're going to see Wyndham Clark. Now here's what's interesting. Wyndham Clark, this is a perfect example of how strokes gained works. Uh, Wyndham Clark is second in this field in driving distance. He hits it a long way. He is losing a tenth of a stroke off the tee. So what does that mean? It means he is absolutely spraying it. Uh, his fairway number, also indicative of that. He's only hitting 48% of his fairways. It means he's missing big off the tee. Now, I would prefer uh, that he be a little bit more accurate, but it's not... I don't think it's the end of the world to spray it a little bit at Quail Hollow, but I, I'm a little bit concerned, but I'm still taking into the fact that he is a bomber and that is valuable around these parts. The other thing I wanted to do was I want to go back to strokes gained off the tee and I want to shorten this time frame up. Let's do last 24 rounds. Let's get some more recent, a little bit more volatility. No surprise, Bryson's still number one. Emiliano Grillo, number two. Um, so he's got 19 measured rounds. He's gaining 0.85 strokes off the tee. He had a very, very ugly, disappointing missed cut last week, which I think will keep his ownership down for this week. Corey Connors is still up there. Sung J.M., Victor Hovland, John Rahm, a lot of the names that we mentioned. And then our 2018 champion, Jason Day, also on this list. Someone we can talk about when we move over to the cheat sheet, which we can do, how about right now? So let's jump into that $10,000 range and above on DraftKings. Justin Thomas leads the way at 11300 Bryson DeChambeau, John Rahm, Xander Shoffley, Webb Simpson, Roy McIlroy, six golfers over $10,000. And we've got to talk about Justin Thomas, if you think that I'm scared of what Justin Thomas did last week, you would be wrong. Let's pull this up. Strokes gained by tournament. Uh, Justin Thomas, if you if you missed it, was the number one player in the field last week in strokes gained tee to green. More than Keegan Bradley, more than Sam Burns, more than literally everyone because he was number one. He gained over 13 strokes from tee to green. Now, here's the big issue. Minus six and a half strokes putting, which is horrible. It is horrendous, but it is not unusual for Justin Thomas. He has these weeks. This is what he kind of does. He's going to be awesome from tee to green most weeks. And then he's going to have these occasions where the lid is just absolutely shut for him. A couple of recent instances in which he had lost uh, five strokes putting or more. Well, one was recent. It was the Genesis Invitational. He lost 5.8. He missed the cut. That was in two rounds. That was wild. Um, his next start, which was the next week, he was a positive putter, and he finished 15th. The week after that, he won the Players' Championship. Going back a little bit further, uh, the Travelers' Championship, he lost 7.8 putting. His next start was the Open Championship. We don't have the strokes gain metrics there, but he finished inside the top 20, so it was probably a lot better. His next start after that... Uh, again, positive. He gets back to positive. And then he wins a couple of starts after that at the BMW Championship. So it's not usually something that keeps JT down very long. He is usually very quick to solve a really poor putting performance. Combine that with the fact that he's just absolutely sublime from tee to green. Combine that with the fact that he won the PGA Championship at Quail Hollow in 2017. The, that was the year we, we we played over at Eagle Point for this event, but Quail Hollow was on the schedule and it was JT who was victorious. By his own standards, Bryson DeChambeau um, hasn't played well. 46 at the Masters, didn't make it out of his group at the match play event. Uh, certainly not worried about that. By design, again, I, I've said this a lot, by design, he is increasing his volatility. Uh, he is 
embracing risk for reward. He is going to be less consistent than a lot of other top tier players, but he's going to have a lot of wins uh, to show for it when this is all said and done. And a place like Quail Hollow, where there is such an emphasis on distance and driving the ball like that. That excites me. Finished fourth year in 2018. That was the last time he played it. He missed his two cuts before that. And you could argue a lot of Bryson's past results don't really matter because he's so much different now and playing the course as kind of a, a different person. But um, there, there's really few knocks uh, for Bryson this week. Just kind of know what you're getting yourself into when he starts getting onto your roster. John Rom, 10,800. We got to do a little bit of a deep dive on Rom at 10,800 because it almost feels a bit disrespectful for, for kind of the way we've, I don't even want to say talked about Rom, but maybe haven't talked about Rom. So his last 10 events have produced eight top tens. Think about that. Eight top tens out of 10 events. It's absolutely insane. Doesn't have a win in there, uh, which I think is why we haven't spent a lot of oxygen on John Rahm and he's never really like never really bursting at the seams to roster John Rahm. But this is, he's the opposite of Bryson, right? He is the, he is the consistent one here. If that's what you're looking for, he becomes incredibly valuable. The last time he lost strokes on a, off the tee, excuse me. Last time he lost strokes off the tee, the 2019 tour championship. That was like 18 months ago. He's absolutely phenomenal with that club that we know is going to be uh, critical this week. He's got consistency. The game is there. The floor is there. Uh, I, I really like the idea of getting a $10,800 John Rahm and, and watching him almost certainly finish inside the top 10. To me, Xander's fine. Webb is fine. I'm not sprinting to to go out and roster them. I'm not going to avoid them. I'm kind of you know feeling average on both of them. Rory McIlroy at a flat ten thousand dollars. You know we have not seen him since the Masters. We know that he now has an official relationship with a swing coach. We know that this is a place that he has absolutely dominated. He's the only two time champion here. He is uh, the record holder for not only the. Uh, tournament record, I think it was 21 under par, but also the margin, seven-shot victory in 2015. If there was a place for him to get right, having a couple weeks off, you start to think this might be a pretty good spot. I want to be early on Rory McIlroy. I want to be early on him. We talk about this all the time. Guys, I'm going to be late on Ricky Fowler. Guys, I'm going to be early on Rory McIlroy because I just refuse to believe he's not going to find it and he's not going to fix it. And once he wins again, which he will, he will be back in that upper echelon of pricing that is going to be, it's going to be cost prohibitive. You know what I mean? It's just like, I want to be on that first win for Rory, and this is a pretty decent spot. Now, he's got some stuff to fix. We've, we've talked about that over the past couple of weeks, all of the, the, the leaks that he is going to have to plug, but I think he's headed in the right direction. He still bombs it off the tee, still gains a ton of strokes. He's fifth uh, in strokes gained off the tee. I'm trying to look at some of his, of his metrics here. You know, he missed the cut at the players and the Masters. Uh, didn't make it out of his group at match play, but that was those were his last three starts. You go back even just a little bit further, 10th at the Arnold Palmer, 6th at the workday. So even as things have been pretty bad uh, by his own standards, the results haven't been terrible. Uh, and I just think I want to be on the upside when, when Rory finally comes through and cashes for that victory. Right below him, the $9,000 range. Let's kick that range off here. There's a lot of interesting names here. Hovland, to me, is super appealing. He's $9,800. He was... Um, he was splendid last week and, and the way that he did it, right? Just ho-hum kind of getting a little bit better each round. He was almost always glued to the first page of the leaderboard. He was uh, one of the top players in strokes gained T to green against eight strokes there. He's 7.6 of them coming through the ball striking category. That is special stuff. Um, when he starts doing that, when he starts gaining seven strokes ball striking, you can see the results. Runner up, fifth, Runner-up, those are the last three times he did it uh, from Farmers to Workday. He actually did it three events consecutively. That, that's, that's the blueprint we talk often about. For, for, and the blueprint changes for every single golfer. For Hovland, that's the blueprint. Putt well enough like he did last week at the Valspar and watch out. This is obviously a course where you're going to have to be somewhat longer. You're going to have to gain strokes off the tee. And if we go find Hovland... 
you'll see that he is fourth in strokes gained off the tee, um, 60th in distance, which means he's just pounding fairways. And look at that. Look at that Oklahoma State headshot I have for him. How good is that? Probably should update that to something from his professional round, but I, I like the way that looks. There's still the Cantlay dilemma that we have at 9,600. There is the Tony Finau dilemma that we have at 9,500. There is Will Zalatoris at 94. And Corey Connors is in this group as well. I think there's going to be a lot of maybe desire to build balanced lineups this week because of how strong the 9K range is. And I just want to go over to the Holy Grail here. And all I've done is I've just sorted everyone in this field since the start of 2021. And the names at the top, just strokes gain total, just best players. Uh, Corey Connors, number one. I, it really is incredible what he has done. He is number one. He's gaining 1.63 strokes from TD, or excuse me, total since the start of 2021. John Rahm is second, Patrick Cantlay third, Victor Hovland fourth. Those three guys, three of the top four guys are in the $9,000 range. So I understand the the argument to start your lineups down in this range because of how good all three of these golfers have been. Could you start a lineup with Connors, Cantlay, Hovland? I don't know what you would have to do after that, but it is certainly uh, it is certainly possible, and I and I would understand it. You know, Cantlay. This is probably another guy I'll be early on, um, or or I'll go down with the ship on. Right? I just refuse to believe that pa Patrick Cantlay has forgotten how to play golf. You know, he he goes out. He played well, I guess, with with Xander at the Zurich. They fought fly up the leaderboard on Sunday. They finish 11th. Maybe that's kind of the spark he needs after missing the cut at the Heritage, RBC Heritage, missing the cut at the Masters. Maybe that was the spark that he needed. And I will say, and I said this last week as well, if you play well in alternate shot at the Zurich, uh, you're, you are in control of your game. Both of, both of the players are. You have to be. It's just the way alternate shot works. So maybe that was the spark we needed for Patrick Cantlay. Now we're getting a pretty good price on him and Maybe I have a blind spot. I don't know. You guys can let me know if I have a blind spot on Cantlet. Uh, Zalatoris is here. Love him. I think he'll be just fine. Reed and Neiman, I think, are interesting, right? Reed has the shot shape where you, you want to hit that draw off the tee at Quail Hollow. Um, he had a disappointing miscut last week. He's got kind of a mixed bag of results here at, um, at Quail Hollow where he's played it a bunch. He's never missed a cut, but I think he only has one top 25. And then... To me, the better version of the guy who who on paper uh, should play well is, is Joaquin Neiman. And I think Neiman's gonna be popular this week. He's $9,100. It's it's a pretty it's a pretty great price. Um, he is a lot longer off the tee than I think people even remotely expect. This this caught me off guard when I discovered this a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. He is eighth in driving distance. Eighth. He is eleventh. In strokes gained off the tee. If I would have asked you to name the, the biggest hitters on the PGA Tour, you probably would have not gotten to Joaquin Neiman for a while. He's a smaller guy, right? He, he's able to harness a lot of that, that small frame and get it behind the ball moving in the right direction. He makes an absolute ton of birdies. 10th on tour in birdie average. I mean, it's just like... This feels like a really good spot for him. He also has been incredibly consistent. If you start to look at this, his last missed cut was the Northern Trust, which a quick, a quick count looks like 17 cuts in a row. It's got he's got a bunch of top tens, including last week. The back-to-back runner-up finishes in Hawaii. I mean, this kid is really, really good trying to get that second PGA Tour victory under his belt. Uh, this feels like a very good spot for for that to potentially happen. He's knocking on the door. As we enter the $8,000 range, I want to go back to the Holy Grail, and I've got the same time frame up there. These are golfers who are uh, just the best golfers since since the start of 2021. Strokes gained total. And uh, sandwiched in between Victor Hovland and Justin Thomas are two guys in this $8,000 range. Cameron Tringale, who contended again last week, finished third at the Valspar, and Brian Harmon. Now, uh, let, me, let me say this. I really like Brian Harmon this week. Uh, he has, first of all, he has four consecutive top 15 finishes. He hasn't missed a cut in the calendar year, but do not fall for the fact that he won this event in 2017. Uh, yes, he did win this event, but it was at Eagle Point. It was not at Quail Hollow. Keep that in mind. So when we go back and actually look at um, Brian Harmon's full history here, 
we're going to see him right here. So this win, his best finish, of course, in 2017, he, he only has one other top 10. He finished 10th in 2013. Most years, he's kind of between that 35 and 60. So he hasn't had a lot of great results at Quail Hollow. So while I like him this week, I, I've tempered my expectations and I'm not going to act like, oh, he won this event before. It must be a really good fit for him. Not at this course. The other guy, Cameron Tringale. Uh, there's, there's really not much to say at this point. And let me open this range up a little bit because I want to show you. This is this goes much further than just this start of, of 2021 for, uh, for Cameron Tringale, who has now not lost strokes ball striking. That is off the tee plus approach since the Shriners. So October of 2020. No, excuse me. It was the week before that. It was the Sanderson Farms. Uh, October of 2020, Sanderson Farms was the last time he lost strokes ball striking. He's absolutely doing it right now. Uh, uh, we know this. You know, we know the story. Doesn't have a win on the PGA Tour, but he is getting closer than ever. Three of his last four starts have resulted in uh, top 15 finishes, and the one missed cut was the Zurich, which you can kind of write off. For a lot of reasons, you can usually write that off because it's a weird team event. So uh, just just splendid to see what he's doing here in the eight thousand dollar range. So I do like both of those guys, as mentioned. But again, remember the thing about Brian Harmon. The two guys that seem like maybe the better fit for this course, uh, based on what we ran earlier, Sung J. M. He's eighty eight hundred. He's been great off the tee. I mentioned Emiliano Grillo, who has been awesome off the tee more recently. He finished ninth here in 2018. That was the last time he he played this event. I'm really interested to see what the public does with Emiliano um, because he was uh, he was near the top of the leaderboard on Thursday at the Valspar, goes almost full Keegan, misses the cut, and now we've got a lot of people kind of shrugging their shoulders not knowing what to do. I mean, he still rates out really, really well. Let's actually look at this. You know what? While while we're doing it, why are we even guessing? Let's go look at what might have happened on Friday at Valspar. So let's see. He loses 2.2 strokes on approach and another three putting. Um, the three putting, not that big of a surprise. He's not a very good putter. That's fine. The strokes gained approach, huge surprise. That is the most strokes he has lost in a single round since round four of the American Express about four months ago. So the argument would be that's unlikely to happen again. Uh, that was an outlier, a weird kind of situation. He misses the cut. Uh, I don't think that that's going to happen again. That would be the argument for Emiliano Grillo here. Now, he has been uh, much better. I mean, dating back to the Arnold Palmer, he has gained strokes on approach in all but three rounds. I don't have his Punta Cana, Punta, Punta Cana or Puerto Rico stats, but the fact that he finished 11th and 6th at those events, he was probably striking it well there as uh, uh, in, in in turn, in well, I don't know what word I was trying to say. I didn't want to say as well again, so I kind of got confused and tongue-tied. Um, but I, I, I would love to see like an 8% projected ownership on, on Wednesday during the live chat, and I'd probably be the guy that goes back to, to Grillo here. Let's see if we can find some trends here. Uh, let's look for, because we're playing fantasy points Let's just do that. Let's just change the fantasy points on the trending tool to uh, January 2021. I mean, I mean, we can go more recent. Sometimes I like to kind of get some of that volatility, right? Let's do since let's do since March 1st. Really volatile. Let's just sort by. All right, let's see. We got to find guys in the 8K range here. Well, Matt Wallace pops up first. He's $7,500. And then Keegan is second, $8,500. I got to tell you, Keegan Bradley... Um, I know it is going to be a, a disappointment for Keegan that he did not win the Valspar. And it is going to be like, oh, Keegan can't putt. He did it again. He missed um, a shorty on 14, I want to say, uh, for par. It might have been 15. He had another. He hit the shot of the day into 17 on Sunday to five feet for birdie. Misses that. I mean, it just really cost himself with short putts. And that's what people are going to talk about. But what they really should be talking about is that Keegan Bradley, and we talked about this. I wrote him up on, um, on Golf Digest, so I'm assuming we talked about this at some point over the course of last week and probably previous weeks. Keegan's laying the blueprint. I say that a lot about guys. Keegan is laying the blueprint. What he did last week, if he does this week in and week out, 
he's going to win a lot of golf tournaments or he's going to contend a lot. So here's what he did. Gained 12.8 from Tita Green, beat a barely positive putter um, and finished runner up. This is it. This is it right here on how Keegan wins golf tournaments or how he contends in golf tournaments. There was also a quote from Keegan Bradley um, a couple of maybe a week or two ago that he said he's putting the best he ever has. And I usually laugh at stuff like that. I'm like, ah, he doesn't. He doesn't really know what that means or whatever. No, the the stats actually bear this out. So Keegan Bradley has gained strokes in four of his last five events, including last week. Before that stretch, he had lost strokes in eight consecutive. So when was the last time he gained strokes in four of his last five? Hold on. Let me open up the date range here. I bet you it's been a while. I'm not sure it's ever happened. So four out of five. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. I'm still scrolling. That's three out of five. That's one, two, three. No, that's four out of six. Here we go. The last time, and this is a deep pool, that he would get, he would have gained four out of five would have been May 2015 to the Greenbrier. And there would have been the U.S. Open in there, which I don't have the strokes gain data for. So... It's been a while. It's been six years. So he's probably correct that this is the best putting stretch of his career or in a while or whatever he, he phrased it as. Um, it's, it's a good sign. If he, keep, if he keeps doing it, he's going to keep contending. The $7,000 range, uh, first of all, it feels huge. It uh, feels like there's a lot of guys here. And I think there are some interesting names. Say what you want about Stuart Sink. He is having an unbelievable year. He is a lot longer now than he's probably ever been. Uh, this is a course that will reward that. Now, he's coming off that win at the RBC Heritage, but it was a couple of weeks ago. Plenty of time to uh, get back down to earth and see if he can contend again. I mean, him and Bryson DeChambeau, the only guys who have won twice on tour this year. So you're certainly not going to uh, bother me with that. Joel Damon, 7,600. Haven't seen him since. Uh, I guess he played the Zurich and then it was the Valero Texas Open and then the start before that was Punta Cana so three starts ago he won Uh, this is an event that he finished runner up to Max Homa in 2019 I wouldn't mind Joel Damon at 7600 but we start to go over to the Holy Grail and see what's going on here and what you're going to see is Matt Jones has been the best player in this tier in this pricing tier since the start of 2021 and I think a lot of people would assume it is because of his victory which of course that helps winning the Honda certainly helps but he's only missed two cuts he's made the weekend in all but two weeks and one of them was the Zurich which again happy to give a pass there uh he's his metrics have been really good he's been a putting machine he is decent off the tee he's decent on approach his around the green game has gotten a lot better since the start of the year this is a pretty interesting play at only seventy four hundred dollars for uh for mr matt jones and then i thought there was one other name oh maybe it was cam davis that caught my eye um cam davis is first of all just one of my I just love playing this guy. But when you start to get this skill set here, where he is gaining combined in ball striking 1.1 strokes uh, per round in those two categories, off the tee and approach since the start of the year, that's a good thing. Now, he hasn't always put it together. His last four, he has gained strokes off the tee while he's lost in three of them. And then when he's hit the ball well on approach, he hasn't really put the off the tee game together, right? So he's trying to figure this out and 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 marry those two and then find a week where he doesn't putt like a crazy person. Um, this might be a pretty decent spot for that. He's only $7,100. We've seen him flash the upside. And this actually... His, his stuff's actually better if you go back to last year, right? Because he played well at Wyndham before having a kind of a collapse round. Uh, this, his, this is more than just the start of 2021 for Cam Davis. And I kind of want to see if we sort this by ball striking. Yeah, Cam Davis is, so again, ball striking is strokes gained off the tee plus strokes gained approach. So it goes, since the start of 2021, it goes, Corey Connors, Bryson, John Rahm, Victor Hovland, Justin Thomas, Keegan Bradley, which you'd argue all of them have had great seasons or great years. Cameron Davis is next. Uh, So it it would seem that if he can just plug the short game a bit, he's going to be contending more often. The $6,000 range. Um, I certainly don't mind going back to Phil. Phil has... Had a ton of success at Quail Hollow. Fifth in 2018, uh, 18th and 17. Back-to-back fourth-place finishes in 15 and 16. He missed an eight-footer for par on 
the final hole on Friday to miss the cut. It was after he had made like three or four birdies in a row. It, he's he's playing a lot better. Still gained strokes on approach last week as well. It, it's he mentioned focus, which unfortunately there's not a strokes gained focus stat, but he mentioned he's he's struggling to focus for four rounds or if like something distracts him and he has to back off, it's hard for him to get back into it, which is, Hey, he's 50. He's over 50 years old. That's, that's what happens. But man, if he can just figure it out because he's playing well, he's playing a lot better than I think uh, most people want to give him credit for myself included doc Redman at 6,900. We've not done a doc Redman deep dive in a while. And to me, I think we're starting to see positive signs. Uh, you know, he was awesome at the end of 2020 in a lot of different categories. He lost, a ton of strokes to start 2021 with the putter. The putter has been better. His last, let's call it five measured rounds, and this doesn't include Zurich where him and Sam Ryder finished 17th. He has been a, a net positive putter. Uh, off the tee, we just saw his best off the tee week at Valspar last week. That was his best, best week since the Wyndham Championship last year when he finished third. We're still trying to put the iron game together as well, but it feels like we're getting a little bit closer. I don't know if it's just going to click or if we're going to see kind of this like slow and steady rebuild back to what we saw at, at the end of 20, uh, at the end of 2020, but this, it, it feels like he's starting to figure it out. And then there's nothing that really stands out for me below that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to rely on the Holy Grail here and I'm going to clear doc out and I'm going to do the same. So let's do for, for these guys. I, I would really like a smaller sample size. So let's do since March. Um, it's probably only. Yeah, it could be like 12, 14, 16 rounds for a lot of these guys. We're going to go strokes. Or I'm sorry. We're going to go. We're just going to sort by price here. And we're going to find guys that are in this $6,000 range. Um, Camilo Vijegas, 1.2 strokes gain total. A lot of that comes from the short game, which is quite concerning to me. But again, another good finish at Valspar. And again, relied a lot on the short game to get that done. Who else? Michael Thompson. That might all be from... No, it's not actually not all from one. He's actually not been bad here. I'm trying to look at this because the Zurich's not in there. Yeah, interesting. I don't know. I'm probably not. Phil's been good. Let's see if we can find anybody else. Seifert, we talk about him a lot. I'm trying to see if anybody's gaining more. Here we go. Vincent Whaley, 12 rounds, gaining 0.82. That would put him near the top. Okay, so... He's played five events in the calendar year, or excuse me, five events since March, which was this time frame that I created. He has made the cut in all of them, yet he has finished between, this is crazy, 28th and 36th in all five of them. That's wild, isn't it? The fact that he has got five starts, 28th, 29th, 29th, 34th, 36th. Wow. Hits the ball okay. Some some weeks better than other. That's why he's Vincent Whaley. Interesting. Sixty four hundred dollars. Point eight two strokes gained per round. That's by far the best of anybody under. Let's call it under sixty five, sixty six hundred ish. Yeah, I mean maybe even more than that. Sixty seven hundred. So that's pretty good, Vincent Whaley. If you're trying to get one of those kind of short, small sample size, quick look back type golfers. All right, before we get you out of here, let's run a model. This is the lineup builder. Um, I want to embrace a little bit of volatility. So instead of doing 50 rounds, which I normally do, let's do like 24. Let's embrace a little volatility, see what happens. Um, I've got a way, strokes gained off the tee quite a bit. There's only, what, four courses on the PGA Tour where strokes gained approach, or strokes gained off the tee is more important. So we're going to go 33. We're going to go driving distance. Now, I don't want to... I'm only going to do 20 because I don't want to double this up because now we have 53 weights for heavy, heavy, um, you know, off the tee numbers. So let's then kind of sprinkle in 10 on approach. No, let's do 15 on approach, 10 on around the green, and 10 on putting. So it's almost like a weighted strokes gain total thing that I'm trying to work with here. So I've got 12 left. Let's throw those last 12 on birdie or better. And let's sort this by value. And oh boy. Okay. Bryson DeChambeau, 92. That's a score. That's a value score. He's my number one golfer. Tony Finau, number two. I would not have considered Tony too strongly, but he's been pretty good. Approach around the green. Yeah, he's gaining everywhere but the putter in, in his last, uh, what did I do? 20 something rounds. 
24 rounds. Uh, Cantlay, or excuse me, Shoffley, Cantlay, Rory, Hovland, Tringale, Rom, Varner. Yeah, I probably would have played a lot of these guys. L- Lanto, Joaquin Neiman. This is this is a lot of guys I would have considered. Uh, Finau, I would have not have looked. I'll have to look at him a little bit uh, closer. Maybe HV3, I will probably have to look at a little bit closer. But otherwise, this is the guys that I think I pointed out during during the video. So I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure I learned all that much. But hey, it was worth a shot. Uh, I think that'll do it for the DFS preview of the Wells Fargo Championship. Of course, I'll be back uh, for the rest of the week with more content as usual. But for now, tweet me at Rick Run Good or leave a comment below. Best of luck this week, and I'll talk to you guys soon.